A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 4, Part 5, Feuding Patriots. By the end of 1791, America had harvested a bumper crop from the seeds of partisan political dispute. Adding to Southern opposition to Hamilton's program, a strong protesting voice arose from frontiersmen in western Pennsylvania, upstate New York, and the new frontier settlements of the Ohio Valley. In these places, frontiersmen rallied around the cause of Jefferson, forging a southern-western alliance that would affect national politics for more than a generation. Westerners were outraged by Hamilton's initial fiscal policies and later by his whiskey tax, a measure aimed to subsidize debt assumption by taxing Western corn products at 25%. In this case, again, Hamilton stood on weak economic ground. He primarily urged Washington to enforce the tax to demonstrate the federal government's ultimate taxation authority. It constituted a flexing of federal muscle that was unnecessary and immature. By leaving these excise taxes on one of the most untaxed and unregulated groups in America, frontier farmers, Hamilton sparked a firestorm of opposition. Most economic life in the West revolved around corn. Corn whiskey even served as a medium of exchange in the cash short territories. Many farmers lacked cash at all, using whiskey as their currency. Protesting the tax, furious Westerners resorted to violence, just like the Shea sites before them. Riots erupted in the Pittsburgh region, Kentucky, the Carolina backcountry, and even Maryland. Led by David Bradford and James Marshall, these self-styled whiskey rebels terrorized tax collectors, closed down courts, and threatened to invade Pittsburgh. When President Washington offered amnesty for surrender, the rebels rejected the offer. The Whiskey Rebellion marked a critical juncture for the new Federalist government. Unless it was crushed, Washington believed, we can bid adieu to all government in this country except mob and club government. He added, if the laws are to be trampled upon with impunity, then there is an end put with one stroke to Republican government. In August, Washington sent Hamilton to lead a 13,000 man army, larger than the Continental Army, to crush the rebels. With this show of force, the rebel cause instantly evaporated. Bradford, Marshall, and others bid a hasty retreat by flatboat down the Ohio River. Although courts convicted two whiskey rebels of treason, Washington magnanimously pardoned them both in July of 1795. Washington and Hamilton took pride in their decisive action. The Federalists had proven the ability of the new government to enforce the law. In the process, however, they handed the Republicans a political victory. Many Revolutionary-era Americans were alarmed at the sight of an American standing army moving against a ragged band of Pennsylvania farmers, fellow Americans no less. Rightly or wrongly, the Republicans saw an uncanny resemblance between the Whiskey Rebellion and the Patriots' stamp and tea tax revolts of the Revolutionary Era. Federalists rightly feared new frontier states would bolster Jefferson's support in Congress, and they opposed the statehood of these new territories. A compromise exchanged statehood for Kentucky with that of Vermont in 1791. But Tennessee proved to be an entirely different matter. In 1796, Federalists vainly threw roadblocks in front of the statehood drive, arguing that Tennessee's census and constitution were problematic, and that statehood was just one more twig in the electioneering cabal of Mr. Jefferson. Despite this arch-federalist opposition, Tennessee entered the Union in time to cast its 1796 electoral votes for Jefferson and sent a young Jeffersonian, Andrew Jackson, to Congress. Meanwhile, by the start of Washington's second term in office, the Hamilton-Jefferson feud had spun out of control, well past the point of resolution. 
Worse, their political differences only exacerbated an obvious personality conflict between these two young lions. Washington's cabinet meetings lost civility as the men settled into a pattern of continued verbal sparring and political one-upsmanship. When not debating in person, they maneuvered in congressional caucuses and cloakrooms or sniped by letter to acquaintances before finally ceasing speaking to each other altogether, resorting to firing anonymous newspaper editorials. Jefferson initially clung to the hope that the president's even-handedness would ultimately manifest itself in public policy. Employing his considerable skills of persuasion to lobby the president, Jefferson urged Washington to break from Hamilton or to at least blend some of Madison's and his own ideas into the Federalist policy mix. Continually thwarted on the domestic front, Jefferson might have endured had he not been so often overruled in his own area of expertise, foreign affairs. Over the course of Washington's first term, the Secretary of State saw his foreign policy aims slowly erode under Hamilton's assaults, and it was in the area of foreign policy where the disagreements reached their most vindictive stage. Beyond the Oceans Although America was an independent nation under the terms of the Treaty of Paris in 1783, that independence was fraught with ironies and contradictions. In the family of nations, America was a kitten among tigers. European powers with strong armies and navies still ruled the oceans and much of North and South America, despite American independence. In addition, Fading but still dangerous forces such as those of the Ottoman Empire and the Barbary states were constantly a concern on the high seas. But an alliance with France threatened to embroil the young nation in continental warfare almost immediately with the French Revolution of 1789. What course would American foreign policy follow? Would Americans form alliances with their democratic brethren in France? or honor their English roots? Would they be able to trade with both nations? Was neutrality an option? These were the questions the Secretary of State faced, yet his proposed solutions ran counter to those of his archenemy Hamilton and his Federalist allies. Under this cloud, the members of the administration attempted to shape a foreign policy. Their foreign policy initiative was to recreate the military establishment Congress had banned following the Revolutionary War. Federalist proponents of the Constitution had called for a viable army and navy to back up national foreign policy decrees. The ratification of the Constitution brought this power of the sword once again to American government. Led by the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, Washington's artillery chief during the Revolution, Federalists reconstituted the Continental Army, renaming it the United States Army. Knox recruited 5,000 troops and commissioned an officer corps compromised mainly of Revolutionary War veterans and Federalist stalwarts. Then Congress turned its attention to the Navy, which, since the Revolution, had been a small collection of privateers. Congress appropriated monies for construction and manning of six frigates capable of long-range operations. Following revolutionary precedent, small companies of U.S. Marines accompanied each Navy command unit. Congress did not create a separate Department of the Navy until 1798 when Federalists would realize their aim of a 10,000-man combined American military force. As is often the case, events did not wait on policymakers to fully prepare. The Ohio Valley frontier had erupted into warfare after a flood of immigrants crossed the Appalachians, infringing on Indian lands. Miami, Shawnee, Delaware, and other tribes witnessed hordes of American pioneers streaming into their ancestral domain. Indian warfare escalated into attacks on rivermen. One boatman reported that the Indians were very troublesome on the river, having fired upon several boats and killing and wounding the boat crews. The U.S. government had to respond. 
General Arthur St. Clair, Federalist Governor of the Northwest Territory, led an army into the fray, but met initial defeat. Newly recommissioned U.S. Army General Mad Anthony Wayne fared better, marching a large column into Indian Territory in 1794 to win an important victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Arrayed against a broad alliance of Indian tribes, Shawnee, Ottawa, Chippewa, Potawatomi, as well as Canadians, British, some French, and even a handful of renegade Americans, Wayne's larger force pushed the 2,000 Indians through the forest and pinned them against a British fort, which refused to open its gates. Mad Anthony preferred to let the Indians escape and deal with the chiefs, who, having their influence shattered, signed the Treaty of Greenville. Although these events temporarily marked the defeat of the Upper Ohio Valley tribes, violence plagued the Lower Ohio and Mississippi Valleys for another 15 years. This warfare revived concerns that Britons and Spaniards aided and encouraged Indian uprisings. These accusations highlighted another Western foreign policy problem. The hostile British and Spanish presence in, respectively, the Old Northwest and Southwest. Spain laid claim south of Natchez and west of the Mississippi by virtue of a French grant and the 1763 Treaty of Paris. Americans desperately wanted to sail goods down the river to New Orleans, but the Spaniards rightly saw this trade as the proverbial foot in the door and resisted it. Both sides found a temporary solution in Pinckney's Treaty, also called the Treaty of San Lorenzo, in 1795 which granted American traders a three-year privilege of deposit and ability to unload, store, and transship produce in New Spanish New Orleans. English presence in the Ohio Valley presented an even more severe problem. In addition to being a violation of the 1783 Treaty of Paris, British ties to Indian tribes made every act by hostiles on the frontier seem suspiciously connected to British interests. Washington's solution to these challenges, however, requires us to take a detour through events in France. And we'll go on with the French Revolution and neutrality in the next video. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.